Hey, this is Sid Vicious, and I'm fixing to do a shoot interview with the Hannibal TV. Before you went into professional wrestling, what sports did you play as a kid? Played all sports. Uh, you know, Devin, most uh, schools nowadays, or back in the day when uh, I was younger, you had to play all sports to play one sport. So I did track, basketball, baseball, football, everything. And is it true that a chance encounter with Randy Macho Man Savage and Lanny Poffo is what actually brought you into the wrestling business? Exactly. Um, I can't remember when it was or exactly how old it was, but Memphis, a lot of people remember when the USFL kicked up years and years ago. Yeah. Well, Memphis had a team called the Memphis Showboats, and they uh, had a tryout, and I made it all the way to the last cut. So uh, a friend of ours, a doctor friend, said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to get you a walk-on scholarship at Arkansas State. See if I can't go there for a couple of years, and then and then may try to really make the NFL because I had really good potential. Well, during that time, my wife was pregnant, and this is when the Memphis territory was really hot. Had everyone like you just said, Randy Savage, Lanny Poffo, Hardy Davidson, which was Hillbilly Jim, just on and on and on. And so they asked me. Uh, this is a strange coincidence. There was a guy. Uh, in the area, it was a promoter for Eddie Bond, and Eddie Bond was a country music singer that also was friends with Waller. He said, he met me at a Friday's restaurant. I said, man, I want you to get in wrestling. And I never really gave the guy another thought, but he kept calling. Took me down to the Coliseum, uh, Mid-South Coliseum, and introduced me to Guy Coffee, who was, was ran everything for Lawler and them. So um, Randy Savage and those guys at the gym said, we saw you at the Coliseum a couple weeks ago. Get away from that guy, and we'll get you with somebody who won't put you in the wrong direction. So I weighed it out, and I had a wife, had a kid coming on the way. They said, man, you could be making money right away. And the money was comparable to what I would have made in a, as an offensive lineman in the NFL at the time. So I said, hey, let me go for that. And Randy Savage and those guys didn't want to talk me into it. And I'll never forget one of the bits of advice that um, Hillbilly Jim gave me. He said, Sid, you're a big guy. He said, this business is fake. He says, so don't care about winning and losing. He says, when they ask me to lose, I go, what do, they, what do you want me to do? Trip as I'm walking into the ring? He says, because two things. One, you'll get paid. And there's a chance you really might get a future if they trust you. And I took that into, in my, you know, as one of the things I remembered. And Lanny Poffo is a pretty unusual guy. Do you have any uh, stories about how strange you can be at times? Well, you know, uh, Devin, all the stories are all going to come back to one story, and that's him able to perform oral sex on himself. I can honestly say I never saw it. I did see uh, Virgil do that one time. He actually, <laughs> you know, Virgil got fired for doing that. He was doing the Memphis, he was working the Memphis Territory. Yeah. And uh, he did it in front of Jerry Jarrett and they fired him right away. So that doesn't always help you. <laughs> Speaking of Jerry Jarrett, uh, what did you think of him? He's very controversial at times. You know, I think Jerry's a, a you know, he also gave me some advice one time that stuck with me. Uh, I think he was a really, I don't know, we all know he was a bad payoff person. Um, you know, there's rumors, whatever about that about him. But he did have some type of, you know, good input. And I remember I was doing the Lord Humongous character and I was really green. I didn't know really how to get heat. Uh, when they said get heat, I really didn't really know what that really meant. So they said, Said, with this character, when you think you're over exaggerating, you're probably not exaggerating enough. And I, that followed me the rest of my life. And if you people look at me as Sid Vicious, I was really animated because I was really over exaggerating. And that sort of helped me out. And is it true one of your very first batches was against Nick Bockwinkle and Jerry Lawler? It was. It was, uh, I was, they brought me in as Lord Humongous. Jerry Lawler had the character gimmick. He had put it on a guy named Mike Starks, which was a strength coach at the time in Memphis, but he was only doing it during his off season. So my understanding, I never was told the truth, but I think Terry Funk was scheduled to have come in and didn't make it. And so they called me and said, hey, would you like to do this? And I actually got to do the Coliseum and, and do like a three week little loop around the territory that that followed. And I'll never forget that. Um, it was me and Austin Idol against Nick Bockwinkle and Jerry Lawler. That's like my first match. And I remember walking to the ring, and I actually worked out with Austin Idol that day. I thought it was really something. Uh, but when we was walking to the ring, they, Austin was going, hey, man, flex. And I couldn't. I couldn't get my muscles to do anything. That's how nervous I was. Because it was huge crowds back then. Well, it was. And th but this thing is, too, um, 
you know, for me, Devin, I, I guess, you know, I don't even realize, I don't remember being my first WrestleMania. I really, when people, that was WrestleMania. Every day, and I'm not joking when I say this, every day is just another day to me, but it's a serious day. It's not just another day. So every day to me was a serious day. So that was, uh, I don't remember the crowd. I don't, uh, people I walked by that I knew, I didn't even see them because you were just so nervous. You know, and it was again, uh, here it is, your first match, your main event, and which you're, from my understanding, which is one of the greatest territories in the country at that time. Yeah, for a number of consecutive sellouts. Right, exactly. How did you get along with Jerry Lawler? Great. Um, uh, you know, we aren't the type of guys who are going to go out, hang out, and have dinner together. We had a great business relationship. He always was really, really nice to me, super cool on the front, did things for me that a lot of people, you know, he didn't have to do. Uh, again, he's just a super nice guy to me. And is it true that you were originally considered for the Vader character in New Japan Pro Wrestling? No, what happened on that, what I was considered for and what I'd already been put in place to take over and that was Bruiser Brody's place. Okay. Actually, it was New Japan. They brought me over six weeks, or, oh, I'm sorry, four weeks early just to work the dojos and watch tapes of Bruiser Brody. And I did the exact thing, same thing they told me to do and I went through the audience like King Kong Godzilla. I was beating up, the, you know, you could, at that time, I don't know if you still can, you could hit, you know, fans with chairs and stuff. Yeah. You know, so that's what I did. It was just like Godzilla. I was running through the fans, beating them up. And the whole gimmick there was I was main event every night, and, and Anoki was first match. He had to work himself up to me the last night of the tour. So actually, I was there to take Bruiser Brody's place because he had already passed away, and that wasn't Vader. And you worked in World Class Championship Wrestling for a while. Was Brody still around at that time, or was that after? It was. Uh, I think he was still around a little bit. But this is the thing about World Class. Uh, you know, at that particular time, Jerry Jarrett and them were buying it out, and they went from World Class to Global. If everybody would remember that story. So when I went down there, it was still World Class. I got to work with Kerry Von Erich, and this is a true story. He did an interview with Pro Wrestling Illustrated with Bill After, and he and he said, and it's, it was in the magazine. It was the toughest opponent I ever had. And believe it or not, those, that little thing like that got to Jim Barnett and some pictures Bill After took of me. And I was in Japan, matter of fact, when they saw the pictures when I came back, that's when I got my job with them. Okay. And how were the Von Erichs? Did they have their problems back then? Or? You know, this is the thing is, Kerry Von Erich was one of the most great, one of the nicest people you ever met in your life, and a gentleman, okay? Um, his brother, how are they in, the only one I met was Kevin, and this guy was, I, I don't know, he, he was uh, just, to, in my opinion, wasn't all there. He didn't have a lot to say and stuff like that. Now, I realized, too, um, with Kerry, you know, we know Kerry had his, I'm sorry, had his, you know, problems, his demons at that time. But this is a true story, and I hate even saying this, but I remember the first time I met him, this is before we actually worked together, it was the TV in Memphis, and he looked at me, he came to me and says, Hey man, Carrie Von Eric. I said, Sid Vicious. He goes, You and I are going to make some money one day. He goes, You know what the dress room is? And I told him. So, like, the third time he came up and asked me that, first I'm thinking, This is a joke. But it wasn't a joke. He was being serious. And me and him and Paul Diamond were on the road one time. We were staying in um, Boston. And I asked Carrie, I said, Man, is there any way that maybe we could talk to Vince and get him to put you on the road with me and maybe I could help you come off some of this stuff? I didn't say come off, maybe we could just ride together. And he said, Sid, I quit doing drugs last night. And he didn't. Right. And then this is one other story I want to say about the Vinex, and I'll be finished with it. You know, when he passed away, I went to the Sportatorium and did a free show. Drove myself free for there. I was working with WCW. I took a weekend off to go there to do the show for Mike Davis of Benefit. This is a true story. This is what this, uh, I know everybody was there knew what happened. Well, Again, I drove myself there, paid my own room, or working for free, and Kevin Von Eric and his father held the show up for two thousand dollars. Now, what sense does that make? Yeah, it was a benefit for them, yeah. the, for Carrie, and I was so mad. Uh, but I went ahead and did it. You know, what am I going to do? You know, but that's a, that's what happened on that Von Eric story. And you mentioned around the WCCW time, you started using the name Sid Vicious. Where did that come from? Well, what it was is I was doing the Lord Humo Humongous character in uh, Continental, and that's when I first got my first deal with Japan. They didn't like the Lord Humongous character. So they said, what about something else? And so 
as I was a kid, believe it or not, I was sort of a real laid back and shy kid. I'd gone on vacation one time overseas. When I came back, all my friends had got me a shirt with Mickey Mouse on it and had Sid Vicious, you know, the punk rock singer. And yeah. that's what they were calling me. So I thought about maybe I'll call myself that. So I got my hair really, really short and put some of that grease in it and slicked it back. And then, I, and then when I came to Memphis from Continental, that's when I started the Sid Vicious character. And how did you end up getting signed by WCW? It was a lucky story. I was, um, I had come back from Japan. I was working for Memphis, and this is what this is the real story. All right, WCW and Eddie Gilbert, which is my godsend in this world, he's one of the really much thing in the world where I'm at today is because of Eddie Gilbert. Uh, Eddie Gilbert was for booking WCW, and they were in Memphis. Well, uh, I was in Japan at the time. A guy named Ken Wayne had went there to try to get a job, and they said, "Man, we don't have a job for you, but we're trying to get in touch with Sid because I didn't have a telephone at the time." So, you know, Ken Wayne went back and told. Jerry Jarrett and Hayes Sid Six to go to WCW. I didn't know I was getting a chance. Well, they shorted my money. I mean, really bad to where I had a guarantee. It wasn't much, but it was enough to make you know pay bills. So I went to him. I said, "Hey, man, I can't work for this." So I quit that Saturday morning at TV. And I'm you know I'm thinking, what a stupid mistake. I should have not quit because the Japanese office was mad at me because they didn't have a place to come take pictures of me. So one day I was going to my father-in-law's car lot, and he said, "Man, some guy named Eddie Gilbert called here looking for you." I went, what? And I called back right away. He said, Sid, Eddie, and because Eddie was a booker in the Continental where I was Lord Humongous. And uh, he said, uh, how about a tryout? And I, I get chill bumps thinking about it. I said, you better believe I love a tryout. The rest is history. Who was running WCW at that time? Eddie Gilbert. Uh, he was the, the he's book, booker. He was the booker. Uh, Kevin Sullivan. There was a, a cast of but Eddie was mostly in charge. What did you think of Kevin Sullivan? You know, I think Kevin's a nice guy, but this is the thing is, Devin, I, you know, I'm more of a disciplinarian type of person, and that's why I worked for people like Oli and got along with him. I didn't mind the cussing. But, you know, with Kevin, this is the thing is, you know, and it, it worked out for me a lot of times. But, for, for instance, I'm just a true story. You know, one time me and Rick Steiner was in a tag match against Perry Satter and, and Chris Benoit or Dean Malenko or whatever. And this is Kevin's idea, and I, which I have no fault with it, but he just says, you guys know what to do. Just beat them up. Well, I don't mind that, but you know, I really would have liked to had some structure there. And I like Kevin. You know, don't get me wrong, but he just—he wasn't a person with a lot of structure. Okay. Is it true you were originally supposed to be a singles wrestler and you ended up in uh, the skyscrapers team? Well, that's what they said. This is what they told me. And they told Danny Spivey this in the very beginning. You know, because again, even at that point, I'm still pretty green and not you know a lot of maturity. So they said, this is your deal. We're going to put you with Danny Spivey until you get mature, until you get better, and then we're going to put you in the singles. And that was known from the beginning. And there's a lot of stories about how tough Danny Spivey was. Uh, did you ever witness any of his exploits like that? No, not at all. Danny was a really nice, easygoing guy. You know, the thing is, Devin, you've been around this business a long time, too. A lot of those um, folk, folk lord heroes we hear about, there was not a lot of heroism about it. And probably the reputation wasn't warranted either. It wasn't a lot of reputation. And I don't know if Danny beat anybody up to have gotten the reputation to be the tough guy that everybody thought he was. And you had Teddy Long as your manager as the Skyscrapers. Uh, how was that? And what did you think of him getting in the WWE Hall of Fame this year? You know, I, Teddy, of course, I, I like Teddy. Uh, he was a, you know, back then you got to realize, you know, I was not a very good talker at the time. It was great to have someone to do the talking for you. As Lord Humongous, I didn't do any talking. I know Bruno was my manager during that run. And so it was great. You know, that, that was still funny stuff. They called him the peanut head. And that was still, we were still having fun. And, this, and the two, I realized at the time that this doesn't really count. I'm just getting myself ready for the, my future. So, you know, I didn't want a manager, uh, but it was okay to have it. And are you surprised that they put him in the WWE Hall of Fame before you? Uh, well, no, and I'm going to tell you why, because they also put the Rock and Roll Express in there this year, and I didn't see that, but I heard that they both were so coked out of their minds that they couldn't even talk or look all on a piece of paper. Now, that Hall of Fame thing, and I'm going to get in trouble for they, saying this, but I've already said this one million times, it really doesn't mean anything anymore. You know, I mean, again, if the, they're going to induct someone like that, they've not called me and asked me, you know, but if you're going to induct the Rock and Roll Express who never worked your territory, and they're in that kind of physical state when they did that, tells you that whole deal is a joke. 
And uh, what were your matches like the, with the Road Warriors? You know, the Road Warriors, we all know this, they weren't great workers. You know what I mean? So their introduction was everything. And after the introduction, it was tough. Was uh, Hawk all there a lot of the times, or did he save that for after the matches with his exploits outside the room? You know what? I swear, you got to realize, too, in WCW, that was a family-oriented sort of organization. I didn't see the stuff like you know, that you're probably talking about with Hawk. You know, I didn't see any of that or even heard of any of that until we went to the WWF. And then that might have went on before that, and I just you know, was naive and didn't know about it. But uh, I thought they were both two just good, regular guys. And how was working with the Steiner brothers, who had a reputation of uh, being rough in the ring at times? You know, this is something, too. Um, here's where Kevin Sullivan, people like this, stepped in. You know, where Steiners were pretty tough, but they didn't want to get tough with Danny, you know, because Danny was going to, you know. And nothing against, I, I like Rick to death, I like Scott, too. But, you know, they're both the type of guys that aren't going to be the type, you know, if you were to say, push them, they're probably not going to push you back. And they're probably not going to push you to start with, but they'll talk that they'll push you. They don't do a lot of pushing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that sort of deal. I remember working with them. I used to press Rick over my head every night and throw him over the top rope. And that was something Kevin Sullivan suggested. That's what I do like about Kevin. If he saw that somebody had a chance to get over, he said, Sid, remember that spot? Do it on Rick now. Rick didn't have a choice because the boss just said, take that spot. You know what I mean? So you got to do that. As long as I was physically able to do it, he never would help me. I had to do it all by myself, you know, but he got over the top rope. And they were known for being pretty brutal with the job guys, but the job guys in WCW were pretty horrible also yes. sometimes. What were your experiences like working with those, those well, type of wrestlers? This is the thing is, David, you got to realize it was me, it was Vader, it was Stan Hansen, it was uh, Steve Williams, it was the Steiners. I mean, and we all were sending people to the hospital on TV nights. I mean, that, that's not funny to talk about, but it was that physical. So we were all in a contest to see who could hurt these guys the worst. And that's unfortunate, but that, and of course that happens. And when did the power bomb start becoming a regular part of your repertoire? You know what it was, it's a true story. Before I went down to Continental and was doing the Lord Humongous character, I was working with a guy named David, his wrestling name was Motley. Uh, he had a real ugly, out of shape guy. He said, uh, "Man, have you heard? Of, I've seen this move called the power bomb, and I tried it. But now, when I got down to Continental, they had me doing the Cobra Clutch or the Sinner Shimaki. All right, so I, I've changed it a little bit to when I got them out, I lift them up just a little bit and slam them on the back. And the first night I used it was in Birmingham at the Botwell Auditorium. Eddie Gilbert was the booker at the time, and I remember power bomb with somebody the first time. I heard someone in the front row say, "That guy's dead," and I stuck with it. And whose idea was it to pair you up with the Four Horsemen? You know what? I'm sure that was just, you no, know, Oli was the booker, and um, I'm sure that was his idea. Uh, how did you feel about being put with a group that had had so much success uh, in previous years? Well, it was, uh, it, was, it was like, you know, for me it was a big, you know, pat on the back. Here I am with the Four Horsemen, you know, Arn, one of, maybe the, one of the best finished men in the business, uh, you know, Flair. Barry Windham and myself, I thought that, you know, you know, growing up watching wrestling, the Four Horsemen was the deal. And I felt like at that point, I had become the deal too. Did you get along with the other members of the group? Yes, to a degree. Uh, now, like, for instance, and here's, this is what happens when you're young like this, and, and I'm just, I don't know why, but like when we get in a situation where we'd all tag up with matches, you know, have a four-way or three-way or regular tag, you know, Flair or Barry would never give me, they sit there and come up with spots for everybody, but they'd never kept, come up one for me. And of course, being green, you don't want to stand up and go, hey, I want to do this. I wasn't going to do that at the time. The first person that always included me thing was Arn. He said, Sid, why don't you do this with this guy? So I got my stuff in most of the time through the Four Horsemen about Arn's coaching. And one of the things you're most remembered for at that time was your feud with RoboCop. Uh, what were your thoughts on all that? I'm going to tell you something. Honestly, I don't remember. The, the RoboCop came in. I remember taking my kid to the show, and I think there was some type of malfunction with him that night at the pay-per-view. Uh, he didn't really do very much, so it really it wasn't very much. And uh, you went away and for a while, I think, due to an injury, and your first match back was a 26-second loss to Lex Luger. Yeah. Um, I know you explained this to me on the phone a bit, but do you want to just clear that up? On okay, camera? this is what happened. I had lung surgery. That's where they went and took, cut away part of my lung and sewed me back up, and I lost a tremendous amount of weight. 
Um, that was from a match with the Steiners, I guess? Well, what it really wasn't a match with the Steiners. What it was, it was, a, it was a, a match with the Steiners, but Doom had come running in, too, and there were some chair shots, and no one really knows really where the whole presented itself showed up. I just know when I went home on that, when I went, tried to go back on the road, I was passing out at the airport, so I came back home and I had a collapsed lung. So during that collapsed lung thing, I came back and they said, no, you still don't look yourself. Why don't you go back home and put some more weight back on? So I did that. Well, you know, and I told you, and everybody knows the story, I, I, you know, I play a, a lot of softball. So I'm just, you know, I'm working out twice a day and I'm running every day and I'm eating. But in the evening times, I'm playing some softball, but I'm not playing the field, just DH it. So I get a call from Ole. He said, what in the F are you doing? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, Everybody says you're out there, you know, playing softball on WCW's money. I said, you guys sent me home. I'm working out. You know, softball is just a hobby. He said, well, your punishment is you're going to come back. You're going to do a job for Lex within 30 seconds, and I'm going to be in your corner. And I said, now, and I told you, I said, you guys have paid me eight months and a great deal of money. I'm not going to worry about that 30-second job. You know, so that's what my punishment is for Doing what I was told to do, I'm getting paid, and that didn't bother me one bit. How did you uh, like Lex Luger as a person? You know, Lex has always been a guy. He's not a very friendly person. He's not very personable. He likes to be to himself. He rode by himself a lot. Um, but I will say this, you know, he again, he's honest about that. Always was is that he didn't really like a lot of people. But I remember one time we were working the Mid-South Coliseum, and, and I didn't ask this. He sent word to me that he wanted to put me over in my hometown, which... You know, a lot of people wouldn't do that. So, you know, I think when it came down to it, he wasn't that bad of a person. And uh, what are your memories of working with Sting at that time? Sting was awesome, man. He was, uh, you know, me and Sting talked one time, and he said, Sid, you know, I'm not an idealist like you, but he said, I work well with people who do have good ideas, and we had some really good matches. Um, just one little incident one time we were in, you know, I, I think everybody remembers I used to do a nip-up spot. And it was usually out of head scissors. And I'd nip up and then I'd catch a guy with a choke slam or something like that. He'd always get a good reaction. It was in Jacksonville, Florida. I'll never forget it. So I come back and there's some guys, and I think the Steiners were in the dressing room, and they were, you know, pushing Sting to sort of say, Hey, Sid's burying you. And I said, and I come in and Sting goes, Hey man, you're burying me. And I said, No, Steve, I'm not burying you. And I said, We do that spot all the time. I said, What's happened is you let these guys get in your ass. And now they're making you feel bad about that. So don't let these guys get you beat up. You know, and, and that, then they all heard that and they all changed their opinion. Is it true you were originally supposed to take the title off of Sting at Halloween Havoc? This is the thing I did for 30 seconds. Uh, now, this is the thing, now, again, I guess is why it's easy, you know, for like a lot of bookers would, you know, say Sid's a good guy to have working for me because I don't ask questions. This is when they only did four pay-per-views a year. And we were I was told at the um, Clash of Champions, said you're gonna be the next world champion. So every one of your interviews, you say you're gonna be the next world champion. Well, I, that's what I did for three months. And then um, when it came down to the that night at Chicago at the UIP Pavilion Center, UIC Pavilion Center in Chicago, uh, they said, okay, this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna get your heat. Steve's gonna make a little comeback. Stop him, throw him through the ropes. He's going to go through the back door. I, I think I might put him through the back door. And then you go back to the ring. He's going to come back to the ring holding his head. You roll him up. One, two, three. I said, okay. So we went through that whole thing. As he comes back, it's actually Barry Wyndham. I didn't know what was going on. So I rolled him up. One, two, three. He said, don't worry about it, kid, or something like that. So I rolled him up. Didn't think nothing about it. I didn't know the rest of the finish. I don't think this was supposed to have been there. I think I was supposed to have won the belt. But I think Flair and a lot of people raised so much shit about it, me being too young for the position. So uh, I can say, I know the crowd's going crazy. And the referees in the ring grabbing the bell in my hand, saying, take the stinger splash. I never knew anything about that part of the finish. But when I look back on it, Devin, that was probably my most, mem most memorable match. Because I feel like when you can fool me, you had to fool the people. Now, if it was just me, I, I enjoyed that. I don't know if people understand that or not. Was Flair nice with you to your face at that time? Always. You would just hear it through the grapevine. Grapevines, exactly. This is what you know Flair, for instance, I remember the first time I worked with him in Columbus, Georgia. This is what you know when someone's full of shit. He says, uh, I can't have a, I don't know what to do with you, you're too big. I went, 
Okay. So I said, if you're going to use that excuse, I'm going to remember that when we get out there. And we did. I got out there and I just beat the shit out of him. You know, I said, you're not going to do this to me like you do it to other people. So I took him out through the crowd and I just pummeled him. And uh, what was it like wrestling Giant Gonzalez in WCW? It was, thank God I only had to do it one time. But see, that was on my way out. Yeah. I was uh, finishing up, you know, to go to WWF. Okay. And uh, that was, uh, that's, what, that's why I was doing that. Is there any reason in particular that the horseman thing fizzled out for you? No, I'll tell you what, I don't remember how it fizzled out, honestly, or why it fizzled out. Um, I came back from that surgery and was in the horseman, and I really, I don't know if that, when I gave my notice to go to WWF, you know, what happened was Dusty came in, and Dusty says, hey man, I want you to be here for a long time, I want you to sign a new contract. Well, they gave me a chance to call Vince McMahon. I called him, he had me picked up in, in his office the same day. She so said, here's the magic wand, what you want? I said, I want Hogan's spot. He said, it's yours. So I go home, WCW hears that I'm there. Now they offer me twice as much, so I'm going to go sign that. I'm not going to talk to Vince. Well, Vince catches me before I leave my house that morning. He gets my wife, and she answers the phone and says, he's here. And I said, man, I didn't want to call you and play middle of the fence. I'm going to go sign this deal because it's guaranteed. He said, well, if you take it, you'll never get this chance again. So I said, all right, I'll try it. Big mistake. And WWE, uh, I'm not sure if this happened during your first or second WCW run, but there's a lot of stories out there about the squeegee thing with you and Brian Pillman. Mm -hmm. Was that during your first or second run? That's actually when I was in the WWF. Oh, okay. What it was, I had tore my bicep that night in Orlando, Florida, and I had left my car at the Hojo's that everybody stayed at. I'm sitting there talking to them, and actually that night, Magnum TA, and they were trying to talk me into coming back to WCW. And I was just telling him how great things were. Um, Brian Pillman started running his mouth, and I said, hey, fuck you. And I had a torn bicep. You know, I, mean, I couldn't I couldn't have fought if I wanted to. And so I just remember getting out. My car was dead. The guy was giving me a boost. And uh, Pillman was out there, and it just so happens it was in the floorboard of my, it was uh, the passenger seat. And I grabbed it and said, hey, motherfucker, you want me to whack you in the fucking head with this? Of course, he didn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so it's it it kind of an exaggerated Yeah, instance. of course. Thing is this, if, if Brian Pillman never had anything, you know, if he really wanted to be a tough guy, when I beat him up that time in war games legitimately and you know, sent him through that cage, he had all the reason he could have fought right then. He didn't want to fight. Oh, was that the power bomb thing? Yeah. Where, uh, was that an accident? No, that was purposely. Where you basically power bombed him on his head? Well, about sending him through the cage, then his head. Yeah. And this is the reason why. Like, uh, like he would come, you know, him and everybody, not just him. All the baby faces hated working with me in the Northeast because they got booed. So we were in the Meadowlands one night. He didn't want to take my finish. And Magnum said, no, you're going to take the finish. So he's always, he was always whining and always complaining. And, uh, and so when we were in Phoenix at the war game, I said, this is, you know, he's running his mouth back there. And so I drove him as hard as I could to the cage and as hard as I could to the mat and sent him to the hospital. And uh, you mentioned Vince said you were going to be have basically Hulk Hogan's spot. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the plans were pretty much to have you as a baby face, as the top baby face? Right. Yeah. Um, why didn't that work out? You know, this is the thing that I don't know. Um, well, one, I tore my bicep due yeah. to Jake Roberts, and I had the, you know had surgery. So when I come back from the surgery, you now Vince says we're going to change things. We're going to make you a heel. And he even said he was going to take my first class seating from me. Because I didn't ask for anything in writing. So I told Vince, just like I'm sitting right here, I said, Vince, if you take one thing away from me, I won't be here. That simple. So I think when people talk to him that forward, he doesn't like that kind of stuff. And you debuted, of course, as a, as a baby face, but they gave you a bunch of untelevised matches before they debuted. Was that just to get... Well, the thing was this, Devin, not to cut you off. Yeah. I was only going to do TVs and pay-per-views for one year. And after WrestleMania, I was going to start house shows. And that would have been the first time they ever done that. And that would have been a really cool deal. But again, this is what happens in the WWF. So when the Warrior wanted more money at SummerSlam. SummerSlam 90, I think. I'm trying to think. What or building, 91, 91. What building it was. But I remember. Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. So Vince says, and I knew this. He says, when Warrior comes back through the curtain, he's going to get fired. And you're going to start back. You're going to take his place the next day. You know, I'm thinking, hold on, man. This isn't what I was promised. You know what I mean? So that's, again, you know, unfortunately, things like that happen. You just have to step up and, and play ball. What was the heat like on Warrior backstage that day? 
You know what? Honestly, I don't remember. No, it happened so quick. When I got back there, he was already gone. You know. You ended up having some matches with him too when he returned. Back. That's when I quit. Yeah. And this is what happened. This is the thing was. All right, so after Warrior comes back, that's when Vince says, You're, we're going to make you the biggest heel this business has ever seen. I've got an idea what being a heel is, okay? So the very first night was in Baltimore. I was working with the Warrior. and he, This was the, the things that the agent said. Clothesline, clothesline. You know, the, the Warrior was telling me this. Clothesline. Get up, shake the ropes, and clothesline, clothesline. I said, no, Jim, this is how it's going to work. You'll come in, I'll stop you, duck my clothesline, you give me one, and then I'll powder. You know what I mean? So then the finish was, I was the powerbomb, kick, he was going to kick out, we was going to go into a DQ or something. So I told the agents right then, I said, now, if he kicks out of this tonight, you better have, now, I know they had phones, I said, you better get in touch with Vince, because if we get the same finish tomorrow night, tomorrow night will be my last night. You know, just that clear. And the next night was the Boston Gardens. So they came back to me. I said, guys, I told you clearly yesterday, if this is the same finish, I'm going to do this match and this finish tonight, but don't call me tomorrow because you're not going to get me. And that's what happened. And I'm jumping around a bit here, but during this run in WWE, you faced The Undertaker a lot with The Undertaker as a heel, and you defeated him all the times. Any memories of those matches? They were always good. Mark and I always worked really well together. Um, you know, it's just, you know, those, I, I never thought something like that coffin match could have been something so simple. Get in that thing and you be the one underneath and when the coffin races back open, you're the one on top of people go crazy, you win. It was just a lot of fun working with The Undertaker. And is it true you were supposed to have a feud with Jake um, before you tore your bicep and you were actually going to be the one to take the snake bite to the bicep right, um, that Macho Man ended up taking? Yes, I think I was going to... Um, I was going to take the snake bite, and that's when I had just just tore my you know bicep working with Jake. I don't, I'm not sure how it went, but I was supposed to take the snake bite for Savage and and have really be protecting him, and then Savage took the snake bite. Were you going to be comfortable with that? You know what? Honestly, I don't know. I don't. I, you know, they say those snakes' teeth aren't that big. You know, so I mean, I, I'm I'm not scared of snakes. Um, I don't know if I'd be ever comfortable with that, but you no, know, if that's what it would have done. Now at uh, Royal Rumble 92, when you were eliminated by Hulk Hogan in a scuffle, I understand that the crowd reaction in the building was actually cheering you over Hogan, right. and supposedly they dubbed over it in the Coliseum video release. That was in New York, New Albany. Yeah. And there's, that's when I gave my notice that night, and this is a true story. You know. For what a reason that happened? Well, the reason that happened, Dev, we know that it was just it, it was simple. Hogan's run was over. And it wasn't that I was any better than him. It's just I was a new face, and I was better than him. So when they did that sw swerve right there, they thought that they were going to start booing me. Of course, in New York, they're not going to boo me. That's how it works. So when he comes back, this is, and I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to be mean to him or anyone. He is putting on like a woman. And he's screaming in the back, going, Vince, you motherfucker, you, you know, he, like Vince planned him to get booed. And so this and that. And, and I just, I went to Vince's office. I said, Vince, I can't work in a place where a grown man acts like this. So I get, had my hand to Vince. I said, I'm going home. I'm done. And I said, because everything you've told me has been a lie. Not a lie. It just hasn't come true. And I've lost a lot of money being here. So I'm, just, I'm letting you know, I'm done. He asked me, he said, can we just make it to WrestleMania? And it wasn't maybe a month after WrestleMania. I had had enough of the Warrior, and I went home. Um, I know you don't really recall WrestleMania 8 that much, but uh, do you have any memories of that huge match? I do. I'll tell you one thing. I do remember this. I remember walking out and feeling that big in, in front of that many people in a building that big. I just, it was just incredible. And I guess you were the first person to kick out of Hulk Hogan's leg drop ever due you, to that. You know what? Honestly, I don't remember that either. Okay. I, I've been told that. But, I mean, it's not that I don't like didn't remember the match or anything, but I'm sure I did. Because you know? I guess it was uh, Papa Shango came down too late, so you had no choice but to right. kick out of Well, this is the thing, guys. I had already told Vince, you know, a month prior I was done. So that's why he brought the Warrior back and Papa Shango. Because he knew I wasn't going to be there much longer. And how did you get along on a personal level with Hogan? 
Man, pretty good. I mean, I don't know if it's true or not. You know, face to face, like a lot of people, he was really nice to me. I don't remember a lot of people saying he talked bad behind me, behind my back. So I think it was pretty generally a good relationship. And you had Harvey Whippleman, downtown Bruno, as your manager in WWE for a while. Uh, any thoughts on him? Well, I'm the one who gave him his break. And this is what happened. Brought him in with a guy named Nick Busick. They call him Big Bully Busick. Well, he got fired within a short period of time. It was my fault. I brought him in. A big mistake. And that's when I learned you just don't stand up for anybody you just don't know that well. So Bruno, who was my manager, and I, pro I promised him, if I ever get a break, I'll get you a break too. No exaggeration. I went to Vince and said, he's going to be my manager. And I came up with that little doctor bag where he'd give me like life support when I needed it. So, and then... That's how he'd become my manager. And you had a house show match at Madison Square Garden against Hercules. You may or may not remember this, but it's the rumor that he no-sold your power bomb because he was leaving the company or he got fired. Uh, is that? Do you have any recollection? You know what? I swear, I, I, I do remember that night. I don't remember. I, I know he was uncomfortable. He didn't say anything to me or anything. Uh, I don't remember him not selling it. You know, honestly, I... Uh, I do remember, I worked with him, I think, twice there one time on an outdoor show somewhere in Florida where I was just filling in. I wasn't advertised. And uh, what was ultimately, you said you left a month after uh, WrestleMania 8. There's lots of different rumors being thrown around. It was just, it it's was just time to go. It, no, it was just this. When you tell me after you know, you know, five or six times things don't come true, now you're going to say I'm losing all this money, which they gave me a higher incentive, like, I you know, I got a certain percentage off net profit on house shows, which is a pretty good payoff. Well, this is the deal is, when you're losing your merchandising money, that net pro profit don't really sound as much anymore. So again, when they said, we're going to make you the biggest hill, and I gave them a chance, change this, finish, you know, and they didn't, then I said, okay, I'm done, you know. Were you already talking to WC again at that point? They had already offered me to deal to come back. Okay. Who was in charge of WCW? Kip Fry. Kip Fry. How did you uh, get along with him and what did you think of him? You know, it's weird, man. By the time I came, you know, once I, you know, it took me like three months for the lawyers to get me out of my contract with WWF. The time I came back in, he was gone. Uh, and Bill Watts was in charge. So I go in and talk to Bill Watts. Bill Watts actually offers me a position on the booking committee. The next two weeks I come in to finish my deal, Oli's in charge which is a great deal for me. Oli liked me. Bill liked me, too. So I just signed my deal with Oli and started working in the office. Was get, I actually brought in, everybody knows this, I brought in Harlem Heat, brought in Colonel Parker, gave them their names, their, their identity, everything, wrote their interviews, everything. What about uh, teaming with Vader in WCW? How did you like that? It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And you were there for the infamous Shockmaster incident. Oh, yeah. And the thing is, too, and, and you can ask everybody who was there, I called that. Or earlier that day, they were doing the construction to knock out the wall. There was a two by four on the floor, and I told those guys, I said, uh, I said, don't y'all think you need to have the carpenter, you no, know, take, you no, know, just notch out this two by four? They said it's not going to be a problem. And if you remember, when he fell through that wall, me and Harlem Heat were standing out there, and I, I, I couldn't stop myself. I didn't know I was, they could hear me. I was cussing. I said, I fucking told you that was going to happen. You know, yeah, because there's beeps. Exactly. Because I told them that was going to happen before it happened. What was, how did you control your laughter at that I point? couldn't. You couldn't control anything. That's what I'm saying. And is it true that you were supposed to win the world title from Vader if it wasn't for the uh, incident that occurred with Arn Anderson? Is that yes. I, I was told that, you know, they were going, this, this is when, um, this is where we had Oli, first had, you know, had Dusty in charge, and they had Oli in charge, and then, then you had Eric Bischoff in charge, and then Dusty was the one saying, Vader's going to put the belt on me. Now, uh, Vader told us a long version of that incident. Uh, could you sum up what happened there? Man, it, this is the thing, yes. Vader wasn't even there. He was in the lobby. Um, he claimed he basically stuck his thumb inside you. He room. might have. I doubt that, too. I don't remember that. I don't really remember because it happened so fast. This is what happened. We got into an argument while we were all waiting on our food in the lot, in the bar. We thought it was coming there, it was actually going to our rooms. It got brought up, what's wrong with the business? And everybody said, and I, brought, I said it out loud, I said, Flair just needs to, you know, 
not worry about his job. He's got his job. We all got guaranteed money. Just step back and let somebody else, you know, go forward. You're not, you're not getting a pay cut. So Arnie got upset and hit me in the head with a beer bottle. And so, of course, it, you know, everybody started breaking up the fight. And then we had security there. So as I'm going to my room, you know, the security from Charlotte, his name was Doug something, I can't remember. Doug Dillinger? Doug Dillinger. So they were all out there. And here, Arnie, now he cracks a beer bottle and he tries to stab me with it. I went, no, motherfucker, this ain't going to happen. So I go to my room. There's a chair in there, and I tear off an arm off of it. So I'm going to go back and whack him in the head with it. When I get down, there's nobody in the hallway now. So I knock on the door. I hear Arm stumbling around. I actually think I hear him fall. And I say, he's too drunk. He's not going. So I take the arm, and I toss it the opposite way I'm going. And as soon as I turn, I hear the door open. And I turn around, and he starts going after me. He comes on to me, he keeps it close. I don't really realize if that's when he st stabs me in the stomach. When he does, I just, one time, he drops. When he drops, his feet are at my feet. And now, out of my peripheral vision, I see the scissors fall at our feet. And he's not, you no, know, I didn't knock him out, just not enough to knock him off of me to the yeah. ground. And he had the scissors first, right? He had the scissors first. Now, he lunges for the scissors the second time. And this time, I give him first. And then I stab him back. Because at that point, you're thinking it's a life or death. Well, it is a life or death. I mean, okay. I know I'm, I mean, I got stabbed three times here in my face and once here. But I'll be honest with you, I never realized I was stabbed. I never knew it until when Tuco Scorpio, Tuco Scorpio said, I guess it was him, he says, hey, man, you're killing dude. And I had got armed by the back of the neck, and I'm stabbing him everywhere. And hitting him with also, not just stabbing him, but hitting him as well. And then it hits me. I'm standing over him. I'm going, motherfucker. You know, what's going on here? So I take the scissors and I threw them as far as away as I could from both of us. So I said, he's hurt, man. So I reached over to grab him. When I did, blood comes out of me, it hits the wall. Now I realize I'm stabbed as well. So that's when I go to the lobby and that's where Vader is. Okay. And was there ever any legal ramifications of that? This is the thing is, they came to me and said, oh, you know, we want you to press charges. I said, no, I'm not gonna press charges. And then they came back the next day trying to give me a press charge. I said, you know what? I mean, I, I'm, I'm messed up, and I know he's messed up, so I'm not going to I'm not gonna press charges. And then they said to me, he didn't have a scratch on him. I said, hold on a minute. That can't be true, but maybe possible. So I said, okay, yeah, I'm going to press charges. So they go back and get the paperwork to come back. Well, that night, the nurse comes in my room, and I said something. I said, well... How's, how's the, she said, how are you doing? I said, okay. She said, your friend's not doing okay. I went, really? I said, these cops just told me that he was, didn't have a scratch on him. So I walked down the hall, and looked in his room, and he was messed up. So when they came the next morning, I said, I'm not signing that, okay? But this is how life is. So when I get back home, Arms sues me. You know, so I had to put a $20,000 retainer with a lawyer in Charlotte, which he never got a nickel of. You know, I just had to pay a lawyer to get him, you know, because he thought since I've got money, he doesn't, he's going to get money, which he didn't. And that's how that, that's the only legal ramification there were. Right, because one of the things Vader mentioned was Arn never thanked him because Vader claimed that he stopped the bleeding with his thumb and, like, he said he basically, in his opinion, saves Arn from a murder charge. It could have been. I mean, I was bleeding pretty good. They had to do exploratory surgery. The good thing about it, though, Devin, that wouldn't have happened. I wasn't bleeding from any organ inside. I wouldn't have bled to death. Now, was it just politics why you were the one that was let go out of that situation? No, this is what happened. I went into the office with my... Oh, this, is what this is what started the fight. Right before we go overseas, Eric Bischoff comes to me and says, uh, we understand that I never signed a contract there while Ole was boss. Now, when Eric took over, I was still getting paid on the original contract, but when, it was, when I was the worked with Vader for the World Championship, that my year would have been up and I would have got to ask for more money. So, hey, this is true, uh, true story. So Eric's talking to me and says, said, you haven't got a, you haven't, you're not under contract. I said, yeah, I know. Now, I knew it, but I didn't think it meant that much. So he goes, well, we need to get you under contract, but not what I'm getting paid now. He said, well, what do you want? And I told him, he said, no, we're not going to give that to you. I said, well, then I'm not going to be here any longer. So he says, okay, well, we'll give it to you. So he gave it to me. I signed it. We went overseas, and that's really what the argument was about. I just got a big pay, pay increase. You know, so um, what was the question again? Uh, like what led to you being the Okay, one so released? when after the fight and we came back home, and I healed up a little bit, me and my lawyer, Bill After, I mean, uh, uh, 
not Bill after, Bill Eford out of Memphis. He went with me there. And this is what they told me in the office that day. If I would be willing to go back to my original pay, I could keep my job. And I said, no. And that's why I lost my job. It wasn't because of what I did. It's because I wouldn't take a pay cut. Right. So you just wrestled for USWA for a couple years mm -hmm. after that? About a year or so. Um, any memories of your matches with Lawler and Dr. Death at that time? No, not really. You just kind of collected payoffs. Just collected payoffs. Now, was it Sean and Kevin Nash that put in a good word for you to go back to WWE? No, I'm, I think it was Lawler. What it was is this. All right, Vince was, and I'm sure he was testing the water. Business for them was horrible at the time. He'd send people into Memphis to work with, just with me. And I know that's what he was doing, to see what it was working. And every time he sent someone in, we sold the Coliseum out. And they couldn't sell out anywhere. So I was going to Louisville to a show, and... I don't know how I got the word, but Vince said, I want you to go to the airport and get a flight. And I flew to the office and then back to the show that night in, in Louisville for Lawler and him. And he just, like we're sitting right here, he goes, I want you to come in and work with Kevin. And I said, okay, we worked out our terms and, and that's when I came back. What was it like coming in as Sean's bodyguard? Because I guess that was probably at the height of his uh, personal issues. Well, then that and too, that's sort of the beginning of his so his right. singles run yeah. too is uh, however successful you want to say he was or was not. Yeah. You know, but it was a Sean was always fun to be with, man. Uh, I know a lot of people have bad things about him, but man, he, me and him got along. We worked great together. Um, and it was just a lot of fun being with him. So you never had any issues with the click, do you? Not at all. Not at all. Uh, what are your memories of your matches with Diesel? They were tough. You know, he's not that good. I mean, he's just, you know, he's just not, you know, not a lot of great psychology. Not, and I hate saying he's somebody who's got two left feet. You know, just wasn't, you know, um, nothing was memorable about him. Did you get along behind the scenes with him? Oh, yeah. We were, when he first started, he, we rode together. So it wasn't that we were, didn't get along. It's just, I don't know. I don't know if anybody's ever said they had great matches with him. That would have been when he was uh, in WCW when he started. You were right. Right, he was doing that Master Blaster gimmick. Right, and uh, your matches with Shawn Michaels and your your title victories. Uh, any memories of that? Just just the thing about Shawn. You know, say for instance, sometimes we'd be put in tough situations, and one of them was a three way with me, him, and Brett. And I think this is the first time those three way matches came out. And you know, talking to Brett was like talk, you know, again talking like the Ultimate Warrior, like there was three people in the room: Brett himself and someone else. And uh, we're sitting there, me and Sean's like, well, is this guy serious? You know, so, you know, Sean would look at me and just go, do you remember that? You know, remember what we did? I'd go, yeah. And so me and Sean go out there and make it look like a million bucks, and then Brett was pretty much lost. You know, so Sean was like that, too. If you wanted to be a jerk, he could be a jerk, too. But if you were willing to work with him, he's willing to work with you. So how was Brett as a personality behind the scenes? Because he comes off... Like a quite an arrogant person. He is. Life. He's he's arrogant. No, I don't think he was arrogant in the beginning. When I first met him as a tag team guy, he wasn't that arrogant. But when he got his purses of singles, he become arrogant. But this is the thing is, and I, I was talking to someone about this today. When people don't realize, when Brett was on top, they couldn't sell out at high school, and people didn't get paid in there sometimes for months at a time. And that's when he was on top, and Diesel was on top. The the business could have never been that bad, and probably never was that bad before. And do you think uh, WWE did the right thing with the whole Montreal screw job angle? This is what happened, you know, from my understanding is that, you know, Brett came in and I don't know how much he was getting, but uh, they just told him, we can't pay you what we're paying you. So they said, hey, we'll set it up where you can go to WCW and make all the money you want or you can take what we're offering you. So, you know, this is the thing is, when you don't want to do business and somebody's setting it up to where you can go Make as much money as you want, and all they're asking you to do is drop their their belt to someone in their territory. That's not that much to ask. So if you, you know, from my understanding, he didn't want to do it and wasn't going to do it, and then finally they set it up where they had to do it. You know. Now you suffered a neck injury during this run, and then you ended up coming back as the Ultimate Warriors replacement. Uh, what did you think of the way the Warrior handled himself then, and? Uh, what, what did they tell you when you came back? You know, it's funny. It seems like that was my whole career with the WWF. You know, the first time, well, we can't get the Warrior to do this. We need you to now change all your plans and do this. 
this is the true story. I hurt my neck and I, and I was in New Albany and we were at the gym working out and I could not pull the bar down with my left arm. I knew something was wrong. I mean, I had no strength in my left arm. So I was sort of scared to tell anybody. So the next morning when everybody went to the gym, I just went home. I knew I was messed up. I went to the hospital and went to the doctor and they said I had a situation where the, I had a bulging disc was touching my spinal cord and one more blow I could be paralyzed. So I quit, you know, I didn't tell them, but I quit. And I went to, uh, I got a job in the, with a company out of Fresno, California called Custom Chemicides. And I was a farmer before I wrestled, so this was give me a chance to go back to my farming boots. So that's what I was doing. And one Saturday morning, I come in from an event with the, with the farmers down in Mississippi. And my housekeeper goes, man, some guy named Vince McMahon's calling here. And what it was, <laughs> truthfully, when they, we weren't getting paid, I told JJ and Vince, I said, if I don't get $1,000 every week, I'm not coming back on the road because I'm not going to be paying out of my pocket. So right. the whole year I was off, they kept sending me that $1,000. So that was a nice little income on top of my new income that wasn't you know, like wrestling money. So he answered the phone. I said, man, what do you want? He says, oh, I need you to come in. I've had problems with the warrior again. And he says, I said, why me? He said, well, I need star power. I said, Vince, I haven't been on TV in a year. You don't, I mean, you don't have one person that could be more credible than me right now? He said, no, I need you. So I don't want to say maybe he knows about that $1,000, right? So I, you know, they picked me up. I got dressed on the way from the airport to the building that night. And that's the last I heard. Another couple of weeks, same thing. I come in and replace them. But the whole time, you know, my boss in California says, you're not qu quitting, are you? I said, no, I'm not quitting, you guys. I'm only going to do this on weekends when I can. He said, oh, fine. So we were at the pay-per-view at Vancouver. That's when Ahmed Johnson, I think it was me, Ahmed, and... Some type of three-way. Three-way, Davy Boy. Yeah, Davy Boy. And then, yeah. so um, we were in the back back there, and him and Pat brought me into the, their little office back there, into their own private dressing room, and said, said, we need you to come back full-time. Then that's when I came totally on. I said, guys, I've got another job. I'm not interested in coming back. And uh, they said, well, we need you. I said, well, this is the deal is, you don't give guaranteed money. And Vince, you know, I know this too. I'm going to say something, get myself in trouble. And then I'm going to be wearing a dress out there and I'm not going to make any money. I said, but if I get guaranteed money, I can wear a dress every night and be happy about it. And so we came to terms and they gave me guaranteed money for the first time. And you mentioned the British Bulldog. You had a few matches with him. Uh, what did you like, think of wrestling him? Um, it was okay. You know, Davey Boy, I, I, I don't want to say I, I like Davey. We got along great. But he was a complainer, whiner, didn't really want to work that hard. Uh, notorious for getting, you know, like, this is a true story, he, he got a really bad rap on Phil LaFonts and Doug Furnace that time they came in. They were they wanted to be real physical. He didn't want to be physical, so he complained about them all the time. They ended up losing their job because of that. And so when a situation like that happened to me, I just didn't give him a chance. I made him work hard. And your second main event at WrestleMania was WrestleMania 13 against The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. Do you have any memories of that one? Just, it was a Horizon Center, you know, it was at WrestleMania 13, and um, it was a um, pretty good little match. Do you have any uh, stories about The Undertaker behind the scenes that people may not, might not know with you and him? No, we traveled a lot together. You know, the thing about him, man, he's a real regular guy, pretty much like myself. You know, a little, a lot more quieter than I am, not as much outspoken as I am. Um, but just, a, you know, we know he's a company man, and he does the right things. And you had a couple matches against Vader. What was that like? I'll be honest with you, I don't really remember him. And the famous Alamo Dome match against Shawn Michaels, is that uh, just mixed in? or? Do you well, this that? is what happened there, guys. Okay. Uh, this is what... All right. We, at SummerSlam, it was actually about a, two or three weeks before SummerSlam at the Madison Square Garden, and it was going to be Vader and Sean. Well, I was working with Vader in the singles at the Gardens before that pay-per-view. And as we came through, and I'm not going to try to pat myself on the back, but those people went crazy, and all we did was a wrist lock, and that's the truth. When we came back, I saw Vince, and he looked at me like he hated me, but I knew, what it was, I knew right then what had changed. They were going to make me the champ. So we had to go to an in-your-house pay-per-view at Indianapolis where I was going to put Vader over to put him in line to go for SummerSlam to win the title. Because the whole idea was Sean wanted to go to his hometown in a big pay-per-view. You know, that was his dream. 
So that's what he wanted to do. So when we got to In Your House, they brought me over to the side like it's a big secret and said, and I already told Bob Holly and I told a couple of the guys, I believe this is what's going to happen. So they brought me into the locker room. They said, Sib, tonight you're going to go over. I said, I told everybody that two months ago. <laughs> I already knew that. I already felt like that, right? So the whole deal was this. So, so when I went over, Sean, on, at SummerSlam, every night was sold out after that once I got the belt. So we was at the Nappy Convention. And that particular year, Vince WWF was putting off a room about this big. WCW had this huge thing down the floor because that's when NWO was really hot. Well, now our, our territory is kicking up. So I asked Vince up there that day, I said, with the business being this good now, are you going to take this belt off me? He said, yeah, I'm going to take it off of you at the Alamo Dome, then we're going to put it back on you at the night, Monday Night Raw. Because, you know, Sean wasn't drawing like that. So after Sean lost, remember, he retired. That's right. So you Right, can... so then I had to wait for Brett to beat uh, Vader, then I beat Brett at In Your House in Miami. And what led to you uh, leaving again after that run? Oh, uh, the car wreck. Oh, in Ottawa. Ottawa. Yeah, yeah. I broke my neck, and then yeah. that was pretty much it. Yeah, I remember that one. Because <laughs> I was actually in the crowd for that, and the whole crowd was chanting Sid, Sid, Sid. Really? I thought it was like some type of joke. No, it was real. Yeah, it was, uh... And uh, during uh, your time away from WWE, you worked for ECW, which uh, a lot of people remember fondly. Uh, how did that come about, and what, what do you think of Paul Heyman? I thought Paul, and I knew Paul from back in the days at Continental. He was, uh, he meant he worked there for Eddie as well. Um, you know, it was, you know, every night there was just like a night off. It was a lot of fun. The crowds were so easy. You know, I didn't ever play, I didn't ever know, remember a place you could actually snot someone, a fan's face, and they asked you to do it again. So, I mean, that was that kind of, it was that like that. And I've heard RVD say in interviews that you guys used to hang out a lot in uh, ECW. Do you have any stories about him from your time there? Well, again, you know, Rod was, you know, for a reason when I went there, there was a lot of jealousy follows me wherever I go. A lot of people were, you know, not really talking to me and stuff like that, but he was one of the few that really was open and really nice to me and, you know, uh, just, you know, welcomed me with arms, you know, and said, so, you know, a few people there did because when I was there, guys, they sold a lot of tickets. And the, maybe the first time they ever sold that many tickets. And you were over with the crowd, which surprised some because you were the stereotypical WWE wrestler right. in ECW. Right. And, um, but then that's what gave me you know, my big deal at WCW, too. And you had a feud with the Dudley boys there who went on to be big stars. Do you have any memories of that feud? Not really. I really this is the thing is, they had that set up where I think they didn't really want me to know what was going on. So everything was just a, like a little spot for me to come in and do something, and then something for them to sort of get their stuff back without me maybe not knowing about it. But I don't really remember being a feud with the Dudleys. So the success of your ECW run is what led to WCW contact? Exactly. This is what happened. No, the, no exaggeration. Eric Bischoff called me. He flew in in a private plane. And he flew his own plane. He was a pilot. Yeah. He flew into West Memphis Airport. I picked him up. We drove to Cracker Barrel, had lunch. Offer me my deal right there. Uh, I forgot to ask you about this because I guess he was there for your first run too. What did you think of Eric Bischoff? You know, Eric is um, Eric is one. Of the, this is sort of a lot of people think I'm stupid to say this. Eric is one of the smarter people in this business. The reason I say this is this: he knew his weaknesses. For instance, he he wasn't great at a lot of things. So you get he put people that were pretty good in positions to do good things, and then two. He had all the money in the world under Ted Turner. And he also, I think, has been honest enough to admit that whole NWO thing was never, he never dreamed that that was going to happen. That was just a mistake. And the reason that happened, Devin, is this. When you pretend to take someone from another territory and bring them to another existing territory, that's heat, okay? But what happens when that thing runs its course, you're, you're left with nothing but baby faces. You don't have any heels. So when that thing died, and I predicted this, it fell, and when they fell, they sold out. And you were paired with Randy Savage when you uh, returned to WCW. What was that like? It was pretty cool. You know, at this time, Randy, you know, had, you know I don't know, maybe living his character too much all the time. <laughs> i never forget one time um, 
we'd been up all night at Monday Nitro, and then we were doing some vignette where Randy was getting Gorgeous George back from Kevin Nash. Now, it went to like 4 or 5 in the morning, so I'm getting from you know, taken from this shooting on site to my rental car, which is now at 6 in the morning. I'm just going to get to the airport just to get home. And uh, this is my memory of it. So Randy's saying, hey, baby, come over here. She goes, Randy, don't, don't start that. Oh, what is it? You with Kevin Nash? You really love Kevin Nash, Big Sexy? And I was thinking, oh, come on, not at 5 in the morning. I don't want to hear a fake love quarrel, you know. But Randy, I think at that point, was living Randy Savage too much. Why do you think he died so young? Just a combination of a lot of things. That's something, Devin, I'm not a doctor. I can't tell you, but it, you know, it could run in his, his, his family. Devin, this is the thing is, there's a lot of people died similar causes. A lot of them just in their sleep. Unfortunately, I think he was leaving a red light or yeah, driving, driving, when, driving yeah. but still there's was, there was these, there was these cases of people's heart stopping you know, for no reason, either when they're asleep or when they're driving or whatever. And there's been so many of them, Devin, and if you would count them up, and this would have been in any other business, baseball, football, anything else, it'd be a congressional act right now about this, but there's not, because this is a carnival. That's why. And you had a feud with Goldberg in WCW uh, when Goldberg was at his peak. What was that like? It was a lot of fun because it was easy. It was a night off. He was over like you can't believe, you know, when you're working with a baby face as a hill, it makes it easy for you. But, um, and I like Bill a lot, but this is the thing is, I, I, you know, I think that's why limited, that's why he had such a short run in the WWF the first time. We were, I was riding with him to the palace in Detroit and I never forget, he said, Sid, you know, if, if I could just go another year Without anybody kicking out of my jackhammer, I'll be okay. I want to say, Bill, no. If you can find somebody that can kick out of your jackhammer, then you're going to draw money. He didn't see it like that. And um, Bill's a great guy and everything, but I think he was so much a kid at heart that sort of was his downfall. And are you surprised that his recent WWE run was so successful? No, I don't, I'm not surprised at all because he left when he was still over. You know what I mean? And I guess for whatever reason, why they did that, that that was already a big deal because of the toy deal. So, and what I'm, I'm, I think, I'm not to cut you off, I think yeah. I'm, I'm surprised that they didn't do more of it. But you, why do you think they didn't? I guess because he, he was paying him a lot of money. No. And... Not able to do it. Trust me. He's a good guy, but he's not that great at wrestling. And I'm sure. You know, that, I'm sure, I just know, you know, I know Vince and them, I'm sure he says something privately to Vince's, Vince's, man, this guy's not all here. You know what I mean? For some reason, he quit, you know, we was told because they were blaming him for the business being so bad. Now, when he won the universal title, he won it for basically a chubby, short guy that wrestles in a shirt. Exactly, Kevin um, Owens. Yeah, what do you think of someone like that being the representative of the company, which I understand they drew some of their lowest ratings in history during that time? This is the thing is, Devin, and I, I mean, it reminds me of the time I left when business was hot, and I came back at Psycho Sid, and I was looking at people like Rex King and Steve Dahl. I'm going, hold on, I know these guys. They're not money people. What's going on? When I got there, I saw business was that bad. I hate saying it, but I see people like Kevin Owens and this Yakamura guy and these other people like this. When I see that, and I'm going, business has got to be bad. Or they're at a point that they don't care. That's the only thing I know. And you had some historical matches, I guess, for bizarre reasons with Chris Benoit with the WCW title change just before he left the company. Uh, what was the whole deal with that? It's simple. Chris... Perry Saturn, Dean Malenko, and Shane Douglas, they were starting up a petition in the locker room trying to get everybody to sign it to say, let's get rid of Kevin Sullivan and bring back Vince Russo, because Vince Russo was making stars of a lot of undernamed people that weren't going to ever be stars. So um, I remember them coming to me, Terry Taylor at the gym that day, he goes, well, you know, we're going to put Chris over you today, and he's going to take the belt. I said, I don't care. You know, I don't think it's a good decision, but it don't bother me at all. So during the match, they, you know, when they're going over, they, said, they came to me and said, Sid, when you put that cross face on you, we want you to slip your leg under the bottom rope. I didn't know why. I just did what I was asked. So then as soon as we came to the curtains, they fire him, you know. 
And I don't know why they did that to fire him, but they did. As soon as they fired him, and then Kevin Nash put it back on me the following night on Monday Night Nitro. It's probably one of the dumbest booking decisions in history. It probably was, for sure. What was he like outside the ring, and did you have any premonitions that he may have had a dark side to him? No. I'm going to tell you something, man. Chris Benoit, to me, it, I'll never forget it. Uh, after it happened, I was just I was in my front yard mowing, and I, I was sitting there going, man, what a gentleman Chris was. Then it hit me. He's not a gentleman. He's a monster. Now, Devin, I don't, this is just totally my opinion. You know, I'm going to go by what everybody was saying. Texas, he was sitting in the Javo and stuff like that. All right, we know at that time, if you got sent to ECW from Raw to SmackDown, you were getting your notice, okay? And that's what it looked like for him. Now, we got to remember, too, Chris had had three, four, or five tryouts with Vince and never made it. You know, now, let's just look at the circumstance. He's married another man's wife in the business, which is taboo. You know, he's about to lose his job. He's overextended himself. And the word depression is right there. I think his wife had a restraining order against him at some point. There was some police stuff going on. As well. Oh, was it? Yeah, there was some marital issues. Well, see, think about that. So now here it is. You know you're about to lose your job. Your wife's threatened to leave you. You got a kid. You know, and Chris was a quiet guy. I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But uh, it was just too much for one person. And that's what, guys, it's just, the business does that to people. And it might, you might not go out and commit mass murder but you either overdose yourself from depression or you do things to yourself that you that affects your family, you lose your wife. This is, depression is linked there, guys. The killing of the child is the, probably the worst thing that happened there. Not to say the killing no. of the wife was forgivable. <laughs> no, both were horrible. And uh, Vince Russo, I guess you were there and some of the time he was in charge. What were your dealings with him like? You know, I knew Vince Russo from the days that he was a, a magazine person at WWF. Always liked Vince Russo and stuff like that. I never forget the time they had me doing an interview in Little Rock, Arkansas, which sort of was my hometown. And it was something like, "You ain't what I was. Who you was." It was something I couldn't even pronounce. I couldn't even state what it said. It was only like three or four words, but it didn't make any sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when I did it in front of everybody, I get people call me today. What was it you said? Well, I was told to say that. And again, Vince Russo, Ed for all of them, if you were there, you would have had to swear to your, you would have, I swore to myself that this was sabotage, that nobody could have been that stupid, you know, that dumb. I mean, I still believe it was. And you worked with Jeff Jarrett a little bit in WCW. Uh, any thoughts on that? He's horrible. You know, he's not that great a worker. He's, a, I don't know, not a great deal of psychology. I don't know if he didn't like me or whatever, but we didn't have great matches. And uh, your feud with Scott Steiner, a lot of people remember. What was he like backstage at that point? And uh, obviously the terrible injury that happened to you. Now that injury was just my, you know, it was just a freak accident. But this is the thing about Scott. You know, I think we, you hit on it earlier. You know, Scott wasn't ever a great wrestler, uh, never had a great mind for the business. But I'll never forget one time he was working with a guy called The Wall. I think Wall's name was Jerry Tootie, which is a really strange name. He passed away now. He passed that. away. Um, he was trying to talk to Scott about the match that night. And the, Jerry was a big guy like myself, but he was just like, man, Scott's just an angry dude. I mean, this is the thing is, if this is a guy running, you know, you got your champ, you can't have guys working with him not able to talk to him. And Scott really thought that that was appealing. And he really does, I think, today think that that's what got him over. Scott never got over in this business to where he drew money that I know of. Um, were you around when he had that backstage incident with Diamond Dallas Page, or was that before you returned? I was there. I just missed it. Okay. You know, but I think Dallas beat him up. I don't know what the story was. I wasn't there. Uh, I've only heard Scott's version of it. Um, now, for the injury that you suffered in the match against Steiner, was that your idea to jump off the rope? Because no, we that. that was Johnny Laurinaitis' idea. That's a guy, an, another idiot, thinking that you know, jumping off the top rope wouldn't be just as exciting as a big boot out of the corner. I even went to him and said, man, I just had come back from shoulder surgery, really couldn't put my belt on at the time, didn't feel comfortable up there. He said, we've already got it into the mix of things we can't get out of it. Was there ever any legal situation with WCW uh, over them asking you to do a movie you weren't comfortable with? No. 
And you returned to, I guess that was the end of your run in WCW, just to close that book. Were you still under contract when the company went out of business? Mm -hmm. So you were paid for a while, mm -hmm. then I figure. And uh, you had an appearance with WWE in 2012, I guess a couple of appearances. Um, what were those like? And are you surprised WWE didn't give you another last runs with all of your popularity and you still keep in top physical shape? Well, this is the thing is, and I was... I, this is the thing is when I've over the years I've got myself in so much trouble talking for myself so a few years after I made it back from this surgery from this injury I actually had a lawyer call the WWF at the time office and talk to him and for me that way I couldn't talk myself into trouble and this is the thing is Johnny Laurinaitis says we're not going to talk to you we only want to talk to Sid but I'd always sent word to him that if I do my own talking I'm going to argue with you and you guys are going to hate me before I ever get in the door so it just, again, uh, that's sort of been the deal. You know, they want me to do the talking, which I keep having to send the lawyers to do the talking. Because if I'm going to want to do the talking, I'm going to get myself in trouble. So that's why I didn't do it. Right. And I guess you might still have some heat with Johnny Ace over the whole in incident in WCW. No, not really. I don't hold it's nothing okay. against Johnny for that. I shouldn't have done it. And it's, that was a freak accident. I sh that shouldn't have happened. I had a friend a, a couple months ago. Just stepping off the ring had the same leg break I did, but worse. So it's not, you know, it was just a freak accident. And one of the guys that's topical right now in WWE is uh, Roman Reigns. Uh, what are your thoughts on him? I think he's one of the better talents they got. You know, he looks credible. He looks good. He got a good interview. And if we're going to compare him to anybody, let's just compare him to the last guy you said, the fat guy in the T-shirt, Kevin Owens. There's no comparison. I think he's light years ahead of that guy. And uh, Jinder Mahal, you probably don't remember this, but you actually wrestled him for us. I did, uh, yeah. About 10 years ago now, it doesn't seem that long. But right, yeah. Do you have any memories of that match? I and, don't, I don't, yeah. Do you, uh, what do you think of him? I think he's doing a good job. And uh, I know you don't go on the internet very much, but is there any social media or anywhere that your fans watching this uh, could follow you to find out what you're up to these days? You can always check it out on Cycle City Promotions. So that's a company that works with you. There's a guy that does my stuff for me. His name's Eric Widgen, and he does, he's been doing that for years. And we correspond maybe once a week just to see what's going on. I don't. He does his own thing there. I, you know, these people that run those things, they think they're artists. And I might suggest something to him. He goes, "See, I got my own artistic view." So I don't you know what he does there. He does. We might have talked about it a little bit before. He puts his own spin on it, but 90% of the things he does on his own. And uh, do you think you'll ever have any more matches for WWE, or are you pretty much happy with your landscaping company now? And well, I'm, I've got that's doing really good. I think I told you the other day I've got a great idea that I'm trying to present to them. Again, I was supposed to, you know, I talked to one of the guys named Scott Amon in the office, and he said, "Well, you need to talk to Mark Carano," and they wanted me to drive to Nashville and meet with him when they were doing TVs a few weeks there. I said, well, I'd first like just to talk over the phone for a few minutes, be sure that you guys might even idea. I don't want to drive that far just to be talking to anyone. You know, so they never got back to my attorney and never heard from them, so that's where we're at. And to close this off, is there any uh, message you want to say to your fans? You know, I do. I like, you know, I really took this that serious before, but in the last few years, I really do. Um, some of the things I might have not wanted to participate in before, I will participate in some things in the future if I'm asked to, just because of the fans. And I want the fans to know that if there's any one thing out there that, mean, that means the most to me is the fans. And that's what I really care about. All right. Thank you very much for this, and good luck in your match tonight. All right. Thank you.